The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 23 Good evening all. Are we all there? Are we sitting comfortably? How are we all? Have we had a good week? Are we all well? Have we managed to... Oh, I keep doing every time. Listen, this is me. (laughs) I checked to see it's broadcasting on this and and now it's talking to me. It's me talking to me. It's a bit meta, that, isn't it? Um, (laughs) Good evening, everyone. Uh, It is nine o'clock on a Sunday evening, which means it must be around time for another uh, instalment of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, We are, of course... Cracking on with it. I hope you are all sitting comfortably. I hope you have cups of tea or you have um, something stronger, perhaps, if that's your particular liking. Um, And that, of course, uh, you have your towels at the ready, just in case. Uh, Give me a shout. Say hello. Um, Don't hesitate to do that. Just drop a, a, a note in the comments to let me know you're there. I'm cross-posting, obviously, from The Bearded Wit onto Giggle Fix, uh, onto Licking Toads, I think, which is the band I play with, and onto uh, The Rats in the Walls, which is the upcoming uh, gothic horror and uh, ghost story podcast that I'm uh, currently creating a lot of content for. Uh, So wherever you are, wherever you're listening into this, and if you're catching up on this on the podcasts, um, on Spotify or Apple or Google Play or TuneIn or Stitcher or Deezer or <laughs> wherever you get your podcast, which is basically anywhere these days, um, uh, then welcome to the show. Um, uh, just a very quick piece of admin. Um, I have put a link, I think it's in the comments somewhere, um, but if um, you would be uh, kind enough to consider becoming a patron uh, by going to patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash the bearded wit uh, and uh, making a a monthly contribution Um, it starts now I've introduced a tier at five dollars um, so from five dollars, which I suppose is about the, cup, the price of a decent cup of coffee these days, uh, if enough of you are kind enough to support me, it will make a huge difference because it means I can focus exclusively on this kind of material rather than having to try and do a load of other stuff. Uh, and you can get a lot more of me as a consequence. There's quite a lot to go around. Um, so if you are kind enough to do that, I would be immensely appreciative. Um, so as I say, the, the link again is www.patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit. Uh, become a patron uh, from $5 a month uh, and uh, uh, get tons more of me. Can't really go far wrong with that, can you? Right, a quick slurp of tea. As I say, if you are if you are watching, uh, give me a say a hello. Uh, you appear in, in my comments and it's always lovely to see you. Uh, and if you do, actually, by the way, if you do drop by... Oh, uh, one other thing, uh, whilst my brain sort of grinds into gear, uh, please do remember to follow, like and follow The Bearded Wit um, and Giggle Fix or wherever you're picking this up on um, because then you'll get notification of whenever I'm doing stuff and I will uh, make sure lots of content gets out there. Um, but it also makes it easy for you guys to stay in touch when I post events. Um, it seems like in the latest version of Facebook we can't... Uh, actually, if anyone has got any, it can say to the contrary, please do drop me a line. But I can't see a way of creating a recurring event like I did last year when I set this this up. So so you, you could have all of these in your diary going forward. So I have to produce events for every week at the moment. I have written 
uh, to, to Facebook, but I don't anticipate speaking to an actual human being at any point in the near future. Uh, so if anyone knows any tricks around that, please do drop me a line. I would really, really appreciate that. Um, but if um, uh, if you if you do like and follow the page, uh, then as soon as uh, I put any details about these events coming up, you'll get notification on that. So uh, that will save uh, you getting lost or there being any doubts about what's happening when. So, good evening all. Lovely to see you. Um, uh, a quick recap. Shall we crack on? Oh, yeah, a quick, quick slurp of tea to start with. Have you, have you got yours? Tea. Mmm, mm, tea. Oh, God, it's brilliant. I love tea. I'm so English in that respect. It's quite ridiculous. And, of course, it's black tea and it's got milk in it. You know, but no sugar. No sugar. I'm sweet enough already. Right. So, where were we? Okay. Uh, we got to a point uh, at the end of the last reading. Um, we have had uh, sort of Arthur and uh, Fenchurch <laughs> very much doing their thing. Uh, not least on the wing of a passing 747. Um, and uh, they have decided, they have managed to get in touch with the person that they think can actually tell them what it is that has happened to all the dolphins. Because, of course, Arthur, on his uh, time and um, uh, distance travels, uh, completely missed the fact that when he found himself on this new Earth that all the dolphins had gone, but no one knows why or where or what that's about, apart from perhaps this one chap, Wonko the Sane. So, uh, we left it at the end of the last one with um, them deciding that perhaps they should take a trip. So, let's crack on. Thanks very much for joining. This is an important announcement. This is flight 121 to Los Angeles. If your travel plans today do not include Los Angeles, now would be the perfect time to disembark. They rented a car in Los Angeles from one of the places that rents out cars that other people have thrown away. Getting it to go round corners is a bit of a problem, said the guy behind the sunglasses as he handed them the keys. Sometimes it's simpler just to get out and find a car that's going in that direction. They stayed for one night in a hotel on Sunset Boulevard, which someone had told them they would enjoy being puzzled by. Everyone there is either English or odd or both. They've got a swimming pool where you can go and watch English rock stars reading language, truth and logic for the photographers. It was true. There was one, that, uh, and that was exactly what he was doing. The garage attendant didn't think much of their car, but that was fine because they didn't either. Late in the evening, they drove through the Hollywood Hills along Mulholland Drive and stopped to look out first over the dazzling sea of floating light that is Los Angeles and later stopped to look across the dazzling sea of floating light that is the San Fernando Valley. They agreed that the sense of dazzle stopped immediately at the back of their eyes and didn't touch any other part of them and came away strangely unsatisfied by the whole spectacle. As dramatic seas of lights went, it was fine, but light is meant to illuminate something, and having driven through what this particularly dramatic sea of light was illuminating, they didn't think much of it. They slept late and restlessly, and awoke at lunchtime when it was stupidly hot. They drove out along the freeway to Santa Monica for their first look at the Pacific Ocean, the ocean which Wonko the Sane spent all his days and a good deal of his nights looking at. Someone told me, said Fenchurch, that they once overheard two old ladies on this beach doing what we're doing, looking at the Pacific Ocean for the first time in their lives, and apparently, after a long pause, one of them said to the other, You know, it's not as big as I expected. Their mood gradually lifted as they walked along the beach in Malibu and watched all the millionaires in their chic shanty huts, carefully keeping an eye on each other to check how rich they were getting. 
their mood lifted further as the sun began to move down the western half of the sky, and by the time they were back in their rattling car and driving towards a sunset that no one of any sensibility would dream of building a city like Los Angeles in front of, they were suddenly feeling astonishingly and irrationally happy, and didn't even mind that the terrible old car radio would only play two stations, and those simultaneously. So what? They were both playing good rock and roll. I know that he'll be able to help us, said Fenchurch determinedly. I know he will. What's his name again, that he likes to be called? Wonko the Sane. I know that he will be able to help us. Arthur wondered if he would, and hoped that he would, and hoped that what Fenchurch had lost could be found here, on this earth, whatever this earth might prove to be. He hoped, as he had hoped continually and fervently since the time they talked together on the banks of the Serpentine, that he would not be called upon to try and remember something that he had very firmly and deliberately buried in the furthest recesses of his memory, where he hoped it would cease to nag at him. In Santa Barbara, they stopped at a fish restaurant in what seemed to be a converted warehouse. Fenchurch had... I think I've been to that one. Uh, Sorry. Fenchurch had red mullet and said it was delicious. Arthur had a swordfish steak and said it made him angry. He grabbed a passing waitress by the arm and berated her. Why is this fish so bloody good? he demanded angrily. "Uh, "'Please excuse my friend,' said Fenchurch to the startled waitress. "'I think he's having a nice day at last.' "'If you took a couple of David Bowies "'and stuck one of the David Bowies on top of the other David Bowie, "'then attached another David Bowie "'to the end of each of the arms of the upper "'of the first two David Bowies "'and wrapped the whole business up in a dirty beach robe, "'you would then have something which didn't exactly look like John Watson, "'but which those who knew him would find hauntingly familiar. "'He was tall and he gangled.' When he sat in his deck chair gazing at the Pacific, not so much with any kind of wild surmise any longer as with a peaceful deep dejection, it was a little difficult to tell exactly where the deck chair ended and he began, and you would hesitate to put your hand on, say, for example, his forearm, in case the whole structure suddenly collapsed with a snap and took your thumb off. But his smile when he turned it on you was quite remarkable. It seemed to be composed of all the worst things that life can do to you, but which, when he briefly reassembled them in that particular order on his face, made you suddenly feel, Oh, well, that's all right then. When he spoke, you were glad that he used the smile that made you feel like that pretty often. "'Oh, yes,' he said. "'They come and see me. They sit right here. "'They sit right where you're sitting.' "'He was talking of the angels with the golden beards and green wings and Dr. Scholl's sandals. "'They eat nachos, which they say they can't get where they come from. "'They do a lot of coke and are very wonderful about a whole range of things.' "'Do they?' said Arthur. "'Are, are they?' So, um, when is this then? When do they come? He gazed out at the Pacific as well. There were little sandpipers running along the margin of the shore which seemed to have this problem. They needed to find their food in the sand which a wave had just washed over, but they couldn't bear to get their feet wet. To deal with this problem, they ran with an odd kind of movement as if they'd been constructed by somebody very clever in Switzerland. Fenchurch was sitting on the sand, idly drawing patterns in it with her fingers. "'Weekends, mostly,' said Wonko the Sane, "'are little schoolers. They are great machines.' He smiled. "'I see,' said Arthur. "'I see.' A tiny cough from Fenchurch attracted his attention, and he looked round at her. 
She had scratched a little stick figure drawing in the sand of the two of them in the clouds. For a moment, he thought she was trying to get him excited. Then he realised that she was rebuking him. Who are we, she was saying, to say that he's mad? His house was certainly peculiar, and since this was the first thing that Fenchurch and Arthur had encountered, it would help to know what it was like. What it was like was this. It was inside out. Actually inside out. To the extent that they had to park on the carpet. All along what one would normally call the outer wall, which was decorated in tasteful interior-designed pink, were bookshelves. Also, a couple of those odd three-legged tables with semicircular tops, which stand in such a way as to suggest that somebody just dropped the wall straight through them, and pictures which were clearly designed to soothe. Where it got really odd was the roof. It folded back on itself, like something that Moritz C. Escher, had he been given to hard nights on the town, which is no part of this narrative's purpose to suggest was the case, though it is sometimes hard, looking at his pictures, particularly the one with all the awkward shapes, not to wonder, might have dreamed up after having been on one. For the little chandeliers, which should have been hanging inside, were on the outside, pointing up confusing. The sign above the front door said, come outside. And so, nervously, they had. Inside, of course, was where the outside was. Rough brickwork, nicely done pointing, guttering in good repair, a garden path, a couple of small trees, some rooms leading off. And the inner walls stretched down, folded curiously, and opened at the end as if by an optical illusion which itself would have had Moritz C. Escher frowning and wondering how it was done, to enclose the Pacific Ocean itself. Hello, said John Watson, Wonko the Sane. Good, they thought to themselves. Hello is something we can cope with. Hello they said, and all surprisingly were smiles. For quite a while he seemed curiously reluctant to talk about the dolphins, looking oddly distracted and saying, I forget, whenever they were mentioned, and had shown them quite proudly around the eccentricities of his house. It gives me pleasure, he said, in a curious kind of way, and does nobody any harm, he continued, that a competent optician couldn't correct. They liked him. He had an open, engaging quality, and seemed able to mock himself before anybody else did. "'Your wife,' said Arthur, looking around, "'mentioned some toothpicks.' He said it with a hunted look, as if he was worried that she might suddenly leap out from behind the door and mention them again. Wonko the Sane laughed. It was an easy, light laugh and sounded like one he had used a lot before, and was happy with. (laughs) Ha 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 ha! Ah, yes, he said. That's to do with the day I finally realised that the world had gone totally mad, and built the asylum to put it in, poor thing, and hoped it would get better. That was the point at which Arthur began to feel a little nervous again. Here, said Wonko the Sane, we are outside the asylum. He pointed again at the rough brickwork, the pointing and the guttering. Go through that door, he pointed at the first door through which they had originally entered, and you go into the asylum. I've tried to decorate it nicely to keep the inmates happy, but there's very little one can do. I never go in there myself now. If I am ever tempted, which these days I really am, I simply look at the sign written over the door and I shy away. That one, said Fenchurch, pointing rather puzzled, at a blue plaque with some instructions written on it. Yes, they are the words that finally turned me into the hermit I have now become. It was quite sudden. I saw them, and I knew what I had to do. The sign said, 
Hold stick near center of its length. Moisten pointed end in mouth. Insert in tooth space, blunt end next to gum. Use gentle in-out motion. It seemed to me, said Wonko the Sane, that any civilization that had so far lost its head as to need instructions and include a detailed set of instructions for use in a packet of toothpicks was no longer a civilization in which I could live and stay sane. He gazed out at the Pacific again, as if daring it to rave and gibber at him, but it lay there calmly and played with the sandpipers. And, in case it crossed your mind to wonder, as I can now see how possibly it might, I am completely sane, which is why I call myself Wonko the Sane, just to reassure people on this point. Wonko is what my mother called me when I was a kid and clumsily knocked things over, and sane is what I am, and how, he added, with one of his smiles that made you feel, oh, well, that's all right then. I intend to remain. Shall we go on to the beach and see what we have to talk about? They went out onto the beach, which was where he started talking about angels with golden beards and green wings and Dr. Shoal sandals. <clears throat> about the dolphins, said Fenchurch, gently, hopefully. I can show you the sandals, said Wonko the Sane. I wonder, do you know, would you like me to show you, said Wonko the Sane, the sandals? I have them. I'll get them. They are made by the Dr. Schall Company, and the angels say that they particularly suit the terrain they have to work in. They say they run a concession stand by the message. When I say I don't know what that means, they say, no, you don't, and laugh. Well, I'll get them anyway. He walked towards the inside, or the outside, depending on how you looked at it. Arthur and Fenchurch looked at each other in a wondering and slightly desperate sort of way. Then each shrugged and idly drew figures in the sand. "'How are the feet today?' said Arthur quietly. "'Okay. It doesn't feel so odd in the sand or in the water. The water touches them perfectly. I just think this isn't our world.' She shrugged. What do you think he meant by the message? Oh, I don't know, said Arthur. Though the memory of a man called Prack, who laughed at him continuously, kept nagging at him. When Wonko returned, he was carrying something that stunned Arthur. Not the sandals, they were perfectly ordinary wooden-bottomed sandals. I just thought you'd like to see, he said, what angels wear on their feet. Just out of curiosity, I'm not trying to prove anything, by the way. I'm a scientist, and I, I know what constitutes proof. But the reason I call myself by my childhood name is to remind myself that a scientist must also be absolutely like a child. If he sees a thing, he must say that he sees it, whether it was what he thought he was going to see or not. See first, think later then test. But always see first. Otherwise you will only see what you are expecting. Most scientists forget that. I'll show you something to demonstrate that later. So, the other reason I call myself Wanko the Sane is so that people will think I'm a fool. That allows me to say what I see when I see it. You can't possibly be a scientist if you mind people thinking that you're a fool. Anyway, I also thought you might like to see this. The thing... This was the thing that Arthur had been stunned to see him carrying, for it was a wonderful silver-grey glass fishbowl, and seemingly identical to the one in Arthur's bedroom. Arthur had been trying for some thirty seconds now, without success to say, where did you get that? Sharply, and with a gasp in his voice. Finally, his time had come, and he missed it by a millisecond. Where 
where did you get that? said Fenchurch, sharply, and with a gasp in her voice. Arthur glanced at Fenchurch sharply, and with a gasp in his voice, said, What? Have you seen one of those before? Yes, she said, I've got one. Or at least I did have. Russell nicked it to put his golf balls in. I don't know where it came from, just that I was angry with Russell for nicking it. What? Oh, have you got one? Yes, it was... They both became aware that Wonko the Sane was glancing sharply backwards and forwards between them and trying to get a gasp of his own in edgeways. You have one of these too? he said to both of them. Yes, they both said it. He looked long and calmly at each of them. Then he held up the bowl to catch the light of the Californian sun. The bowl seemed almost to sing with the sun, to chime with the intensity of its light, and cast darkly brilliant rainbows around the sand and upon them. He turned it and turned it. They could see quite clearly in the fine tracery of its etchwork the words So long and thanks for all the fish. Do you know, asked Wonko quietly, what it is? They each shook their heads slowly, and with wonder, almost hypnotised by the flashing of the lightning shadows in the grey glass. It is a farewell gift from the dolphins, said Wonko, in an increasingly low and quiet voice. The dolphins whom I loved and studied, and swam with, and fed with fish, and even tried to learn their language, a task which they seemed to make impossibly difficult, considering the fact that I now realize that they were perfectly capable of communicating in hours if they decided they wanted to. He shook his head with a slow, slow smile, and then looked again at Fenchurch, and then at Arthur. Have you, he said to Arthur, what have you done with yours? May I ask you that? Um, <clears throat> I keep a fish in it, he said Arthur, slightly embarrassed. I happened to have this fish I was wondering what to do with, and uh, there was this bowl he tailed off. You've done nothing else? No, he said. No, if you had, you'd know. He shook his head again. My wife kept wheat germ in ours, resumed Wonko with some new tone in his voice, until last night. What? said Arthur, slowly and hushedly. What happened last night? We ran out of wheat germ, said Wonko evenly. My wife, he added, has gone to get some more. He seemed lost with his own thoughts for a moment. And, and what happened then? said Fenchurch in the same breathless tone. I washed it, said Wonko. I washed it very carefully, very, very carefully, removing every last speck of wheat germ, and then I dried it slowly with a lint-free cloth, slowly, carefully, turning it over and over. Then I held it to my ear. Have you... Have you held one to your ear? They both shook their heads, again slowly, again dumbly. Perhaps, he said, you should. Slap of tea. The deep roar of the ocean, the break of waves on shores farther than thought can find, the silent thunders of the deep, and from among it voices calling, and yet not voices, humming trillings, wordlings, the half-articulated songs of thought. Greetings. Waves of greetings sliding back down in the in, into the in, inarticulate wor 
try that again, sorry folks. Greetings, waves of greetings, sliding back down into the inarticulate, words breaking together. A crash of sorrow on the shores of earth. Waves of joy on where? A world indescribably found, indescribably arrived at, indescribably wet. A song of water. A fugue of voices now, clamouring for explanations of a disaster unavertable, a world to be destroyed, a surge of helplessness, a spasm of despair, a dying fall, again the break of words. And then the fling of hope, the finding of a shadow earth in the implications of enfolded time, submerged dimensions, the pull of parallels, the deep pull, the spin of will, the hurl and split of it, the flight. A new earth pulled into replacement, the dolphins gone. Then, stunningly, a single voice, quite clear. This bowl was brought to you by the campaign to save the humans. We bid you farewell. And then the sound of long, heavy, perfectly grey bodies rolling away into an unknown, fathomless deep, quietly giggling. That night they stayed outside the asylum and watched TV from inside it. This is what I wanted you to see, said Wonko the Sane when the news came round again. An old colleague of mine, he's over in your country running an investigation, just watch. It was a press conference. Uh, I'm afraid I can't comment on the name Rainguard at this present time, and we are calling him an example of a spontaneous paracausal meteorological phenomenon. Uh, Can you tell us what that means? I'm not altogether sure. Uh, Let's be straight here. If we find something we can't understand, we like to call it something you can't understand, or indeed pronounce. I mean, if we just let you go around calling him a rain god, then that suggests you know something we don't, and I'm afraid we couldn't have that. No, first we have to call it something which says it's ours, not yours. Then we set about finding some way of proving that it's not what you said it is, but something that we say it is. And if it turns out that you're right, you'll still be wrong, because we will simply call him a uh, supernormal. Not paranormal or supernatural, because you think you know what those mean now. No, a supernormal incremental precipitation inducer. We'll probably want to shove a quasi in there at some point to protect ourselves. Rain God! Ha! Huh. Never heard such nonsense in my life. Admittedly, you wouldn't catch me going on holiday with him. Thanks, that'll be all for now, other than to say to hi to Wonko if he's watching. On the way home, there was a woman sitting next to them on the plane who was looking at them rather oddly. They talked quietly to themselves. I still have to know, said Fenchurch. And I feel strongly that you know something that you're not telling me. Arthur sighed and took out a piece of paper. "'Do you have a pencil?' he said. "'She dug around and found one. "'What are you doing, sweetheart?' she said, "'after he'd spent twenty minutes frowning, "'chewing the pencil, scribbling on the paper, "'crossing things out, scribbling again, "'chewing the pencil again, "'and grunting irritably to himself. "'Trying to remember an address someone once gave me.' Your life would be an awful lot simpler, she said, if you bought yourself an address book. Finally, he passed the paper to her. You look after it, he said. She looked at it. Among all the scratchings and crossing outs were the words Quenchulous Quasgar Mountains, Sevobi Upstri, Planetive Prelumtarn, Sun, Zars, Galactic Sector, QQ7, Active J, Gamma. And what's there? Apparently, 
said Arthur. It's God's final message to his creation. That sounds a bit more like it, said Fenchurch. How do we get there? You really? Yes, said Fenchurch firmly. I really want to know. Arthur looked out of the scratchy little perspex window at the the open sky outside. "Uh, Excuse me, said the woman, who'd been looking at them rather oddly, suddenly. I hope you don't think I'm rude. I get so bored on these long flights. It's, uh, It's nice to talk to somebody. My name's Enid Kappelson. I'm from Boston. Tell me. Do you fly a lot? They went to Arthur's house in the West Country, shoved a couple of towels and stuff in a bag, and then sat down to do what every galactic hitchhiker ends up spending most of his time doing. They waited for a flying saucer to come by. "'Friend of mine did this for fifteen years,' said Arthur one night as they sat forlornly watching the sky. "'Who is that?' called Ford Prefect. He caught himself doing something he'd never really expected to do again. He was wondering where Ford Prefect was. By an extraordinary coincidence, the following day there were two reports in the paper, one concerning the most astonishing incident with a flying saucer and the other about a series of unseemly riots in pubs. Ford Prefect turned up the day after... (laughs) <laughs> for prefect turned up the day after that look the day after oh, sorry i'm i'm chewing me own teeth here for prefect turned up the day after that looking hungover and complaining that arthur never answered his phone in fact he looked extremely ill not merely as if he'd been pulled through a hedge backwards but as if the hedge was being simultaneously pulled backwards through a combine harvester He staggered into Arthur's sitting room, waving aside all offers of support, which was an error, because the effort of waving caused him to lose his balance altogether, and Arthur had eventually to drag him to his feet. "'Thank you,' said Ford. "'Thank you very much. Have you?' he said, and then fell asleep for three hours. "'The faintest idea,' he continued suddenly, when he revived, how hard it is to tap into the British phone system from the Pleiades. I can see that you haven't, so I'll tell you, he said, over the very large mug of black coffee that you are about to make. He followed Arthur wobbly in... I'm not doing well this evening, sorry. He followed Arthur wobbly, wobbly, that's not easily to say. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> he followed, sorry. Oh God, the problems of doing stuff live sometimes. <laughs> okay, T, hold on a second. That might help. That might help matters. Oh, damn. Okay. He followed Arthur wobbly, wobbly, wobbly. Yes, there you go. He followed Arthur wobbly into the. <laughs> Doesn't that sound right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, now I've got the giggles. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. (laughs) He followed Arthur wobbly into the kitchen. Stupid operators keep asking you where you're calling from, and you try to tell them Letchworth, and they say that you couldn't be if you're coming in on that circuit. What are you doing? Making you some black coffee. Oh, Ford seemed oddly disappointed. He looked about the place forlornly. What's this? he said. Rice Krispies. And this? Paprika. I see, said Ford, solemnly, and put the two items back down, one on top of the other. But that didn't seem to balance properly, so he put the other on top of the other one, and that seemed to work. A little uh, space lagged, he said. What was I saying? About not phoning from Letchworth. I wasn't, I explained to this lady. Bugger Letchworth, I said. If that's your attitude, I am in fact calling from a sales scout ship of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation, currently on the sublight speed leg of a journey between the stars known to your world, though not necessarily to you, dear lady, I said. Dear lady, explained Port Free before Prefect, because I didn't want her to be offended by my implication that she was an ignorant cretin. Tactful, 
said Arthur Dent. Exactly, said Ford. Tactful, he frowned. Space lag. It's very bad for subclauses. You'll have to assist me again, he continued, by reminding me what I was talking about. Between the stars, said Arthur, known to your world, though not necessarily to you, dear lady, as... Ah, yeah, Pleiades Epsilon and Pleiades Zeta, continued Ford triumphantly. This conversation, Lark, is quite a gas, isn't it? Have some coffee. Thank you, no. And the reason, I said, why I'm bothering you with it, rather than just dialing direct as I could, because we could have some pretty sophisticated telecommunications equipment out here in the Pleiades, I can tell you, is that the penny-pitching son-of-a-star-beast piloting this son-of-a-star-beast ship insists that I call collect. Can you believe that? And could she? I don't know. She'd hung up, said Ford. Uh. So, what do you suppose, he asked fiercely, I did next? I've no idea, Ford said Arthur. Pity, said Ford. I was hoping you could remind me. I really hate those guys, you know. They really are the creeps of the cosmos, buzzing around the celestial infinite with their junky little machines that never work properly, or, when they do, perform functions that no sane man would ever require of them, and, he added savagely, go beep to tell you when they've bloody well done it. It was perfectly true, and a very respectable view, widely held by the right-thinking people of the galaxy, who are largely recognisable as being right-thinking people by the mere fact that they hold this view. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in a moment of reasoned lucidity, which is almost unique among its current tally of 5,975,509 pages, says of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation products that it is very easy to be easy to be blinded by the essential uselessness of them by the sense of achievement you get from getting them to work at all. In other words... And this is the rock-solid principle on which the whole of the corporation's galaxy-wide success is founded. Their fundamental design flaws are completely hidden by their superficial design flaws. And this guy, ranted Ford, was on a drive to sell more of them. His five-year mission to seek out and explore strange new worlds and sell advanced music substitute systems to their restaurants, elevators and wine bars or if they didn't have any restaurants, elevators and wine bars yet, to artificially accelerate their civilization growth until they bloody well did have. Where's that coffee? I threw it away. Make some more. I have now remembered what I did next. I saved civilization as we know it. I knew it was something like that. He stumbled determinedly back into the sitting room, where he seemed to carry on talking to himself, tripping over the furniture and making beep-beep noises. A couple of minutes later... Wearing his very placid face, Arthur followed him. Ford looked stunned. Where have you been? he demanded. Making some coffee, said Arthur, still wearing his very placid face. He had long ago realised that the only way of being in Ford's company successfully was to keep a very large stock of very placid faces and wear them at all times. You missed the best bit, raged Ford. You missed the bit where I jumped the guy. Now, he said, I shall have to jump him, jump him all over him, all over again. He hurled himself recklessly at a chair and broke it. It was better last time, he said suddenly, and waved vaguely in the direction of another broken chair, which he'd already got trussed up on the dining table. I see, said Arthur, casting a placid eye over the trussed-up wreckage. And, um, what are all the ice cubes for? What? screamed Ford. What? You, you missed that bit too? That's the suspended animation facility. I put the guy in the suspended animation facility. Well, I had to, didn't I? So it would seem, said Arthur in his placid voice. Don't touch that, yelled Ford. Arthur, who was about to replace the phone, which was for some reason lying on, on the table off the hook, paused placidly. OK, said Ford, calming down. Listen to it. Arthur put the phone to his ear. It's the speaking clock, he said. Beep, 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 
said Ford, is exactly what's being heard all over that guy's ship while he sleeps in the ice going slowly around a little known moon of Sassafras Magna. The London speaking clock. A sea, said Arthur again, and decided that now was the time to ask the big one. Why? he asked placidly. With a bit of luck, said Ford, the phone bill will bankrupt the buggers. He threw himself, sweating, onto the sofa. Anyway, he said, dramatic arrival, don't you think? And I think that that's where we'll leave it for this evening. Don't want to go on too long. I need to keep my back in good shape, as you know. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. If you're a new listener, welcome. Uh, you can find all of the um, uh, the previous episodes, uh, both on my Facebook page, but also uh, on uh, the Bearded Wit or the Giggle Fix podcast, which you can find, as I say, on Spotify and on uh, um, everywhere, basically Apple, Google, um, TuneIn Radios, Ditcher, Steezer, Steezer, no, <laughs> the Deezer and Stitcher, um, anywhere, basically. If you, if you search for the, be- the Bearded Wit uh, or the Giggle Fix podcast, you will find these episodes there. Um I will be doing this on a continuing basis, as promised, every Sunday at 9pm uh, Central European time. I'm, I'm living here in Denmark. Um, thank you uh, to everybody that's... Uh, I, I forgot to do this at the top of the show, but thank you to everybody that sends messages to me each week. It's really lovely. Uh, I'm so pleased there are so many of you around the world that are listening to this now, so thank you very much for your feedback. Um, keep your eyes peeled for the rats in the walls. I've been very busy recording content for that. And if you if you like a dose of uh, classic uh, ghost stories and uh, sort of gothic horror, that will be coming very soon. Um, but in the meantime, have a super week. Look after yourselves. Stay safe wherever you are. Uh, follow all necessary safety precautions. Um, be good to yourselves. Be good to everyone around you. Um, and uh, see you next week. Thank you very much, everybody. See you soon. Bye.